What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Bros Bros. You knows we are your BFF of the internet. I'm your host, Viet, and we're going to continue giving you guys our beer recommendations, our BBWK Bros Beers. We know this episode, the beer we recommend is El Sully by 21st Amendment Brewery. It's a Mexican style lager and it's brewed with Northern Brewer hops. So it has a light crisp character, but there's just a hint of spice. It basically drinks like a lager, but there's just a little bit of a kick to it at the end. You guys should pick it up. It's called 21st Amendment Brewery El Sully. And remember guys, enjoy responsibly. Before I go any further, just a quick shout out to our sponsors, DC Dog Runner. We're going to pan to the the commercial real quick. Hi, I'm professional podcaster slash DJ Viet. Do you or a loved one have a dog that needs walking, but actually running's better for it, so it actually needs running? Well, DC Dog Runner has the answer for you. DC Dog Runner services the Maryland, Virginia, and DC area. Guys, check out their website, dcdogrunner.com. And right now, if you use promo code Mitch Moreland, you'll get a free complimentary run. Once again, that is dcdogrunner.com. I'll be putting their information in the description below. Check them out. We have an awesome episode for you guys today. We're going to talk a little UFC 202, the rematch between Conor McGregor and Nate Diaz. And then we're going to move on, talk a little bit about the newly crowned welterweight champion Tyrone Woodley and how he is trying to choose his next opponent. And then after that, we're going to talk a little NBA and the summer of crazy spending. To help me break down both the UFC and the NBA, I brought on Psyched, a.k.a. Brian, 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 (laughs) a.k.a. Brian, a.k.a. Mr. Marathon. You're about to run a marathon soon, aren't you? I am. Now, before we get started, is it just coincidental that I'm on during like Mexican beer week? Oh, no. It, it was for you. That was yes. for you, my friend. <laughs> That's what I like. That's what I like. I am. So, uh, back to uh, topic. In October. October 9th, I'll be going to Chicago uh, to run the Chicago Marathon for the second time. It'll be my third overall, and I'm really, really fired up about it. I mean, he is a professional runner. Right? The, we should mention, this is the <laughs> president and CEO of DC Dog Runner. I'm going to have to be on my best behavior. He is our <laughs> our, our main sponsor here. Yeah, I'm checking in on these guys. i going to see what my, uh, what my investment's doing. Um, no, this is great, man. I'm really excited to be back uh, again. You know, we did this thing last year with the NBA Roundup. Uh, looking forward to, to branching out a little bit and talking about MMA, you guys' wheelhouse. Um, yeah, I stick to running mostly. Uh, I have a good time doing it. I run for a living, so I don't know that I'm a professional runner, but I do get paid to run, so in a roundabout way, you're absolutely right. Uh, wherever the next... Tokyo? Is that where we're going? Tokyo. Look for me in Tokyo 2020 uh, if they ever add a dog running event. Oh, they really should. I mean, they have dressage. <laughs> Just a little shout out for you, but you were recently featured in Runner's World. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. That was, uh, that was totally by happenstance, you know, it's really funny. They have all of these, you know, I watch a lot of, I consume a lot of information trying to, to grow uh, the company, do all these kinds of things. And there's all these little um, shortcuts that you do. And in the end, what ended up working for me was uh, being available when a guy emailed me. He was writing a piece, did a little research, and the work that I had done, kind of building the Instagram, building the website, all that kind of stuff, um, made me look, you know, legit enough. And he had a couple questions for me. I took my time with it. And they ended up using a lot of stuff that I had to, to say about running with dogs. So, yeah, it's out there um, online. I think it's, I don't remember the exact title, but you can search it for sure. It's, uh, you know, the 20 best dogs to run with or something like that. Um, and I gave my input. So it was really cool to be to be kind of, um, it was really cool to be featured uh, in Runner's World magazine. Yeah, and we'll try to find that, find a link for that, and we'll put that in the description below so you guys can check that out. Brian. You got a new website that you run, Texas Triangle Trio. Can you tell me a little bit about Texas Triangle Trio? For sure. This is a little pet project. Um, I have a lot of pet projects. You do have a lot of pet projects. (laughs) (laughs) But I just want to do what's enjoyable and what's fun. And what's fun is bringing people together. So I'm not a particularly good writer, but what I am good at is bringing people together. And I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask people to help me out. I'm not afraid to ask for help. So the idea is, uh, you know, yourself... David, who frequents this podcast, and myself uh, are all from Texas, 
each uh, having allegiances to one of the three big cities, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. Um, so that's known as the, uh, the, the, the Texas tri uh, Triangle. For any of you uh, basketball fans, you already know that. So I named it the Texas Triangle Trio because we all have rooting allegiances uh, to those three cities. Um, and really just want to pump out, like, sports thoughts. And that's it. You actually have, like, a ton of writers and, and people <laughs> submitting stuff. It's, it's really awesome. They, we got articles on hockey up there, a uh, ton of articles on baseball, uh, I'm pretty sure with uh, NFL season right around yeah, the corner. Yeah, we're so that's, start getting it's, the it's baseball heavy right now because, you know, it's the only sport going on, but as preseason is ramping up, we've already got a, uh, a Cowboys uh, beat writer, so we'll, if there's anybody out there that's from Houston, um, hit us up, man. Hit up Viet, hit up me. You know, we're on Twitter, we're on uh, Instagram, TX Triangle Trio, I think, on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, or myself, B B C A R D U S B B Cardus uh, at tw uh, on Twitter. So either one of those, man, we're looking for help all the time. And there's no, uh, we're not very good editors, so it's a lot of stuff just kind of goes up there, and we'll, we'll kind of figure it out as we go. But it's just, uh, we're having fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'll be again putting that information, putting his Twitter handle and that information in the description below, so you guys can check that out. There's something else I want to bring up. Haven't done it on an episode yet, but both you and you mentioned uh, David, fellow uh, bro is bro. You guys are both expecting little bundles of bros this fall, so we just want to, from the BBYK family, extend the biggest of congratulations to you guys. We're going to be talking about the NBA in a bit, so I kind of want to extend that NBA metaphor, but Brian's a veteran. You know, he's, he's longtime dad. Has a few kids now, so you know this is this is this is not new for him. Uh, David, he's a rookie. You know, he's he's a rookie when it comes to being a dad. Brian, you know, he's he's got that veteran status. His his family just extended him on the bird rights, so he's he's making that like maximum contract Harrison Barnes money. Whereas Dave, as a rookie, I mean, he was more like a, a Rashard Lewis situation where like he looked like he was a projected first round pick, kept slipping. Now he like got picked in the second round, has a chip on his shoulder. The, uh, the jury's still out there, but congratulations to you both. I know you're a hell of a dad. I know David's going to be a hell of a dad. Just a, a shout out there to the dad bros out there. On to our first topic. We're just going to go right into the main event. Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz. Now the first fight, Nate took it on 10 days notice. And at the time, most people didn't really give him a shot at winning the fight. I think the betting lines were four to one in Conor McGregor's favor. And most people were thinking, 10 days notice? He was supposed to fight the champion of the, the lightweight division. Now he's fighting a guy that's not even top five in the weight class, out of shape, 10 days notice. Like, this is obviously a setup fight. I mean, maybe Nate can sell fights because he trash talks, and, you know, MMA fans love him. Yeah. But he was, he was, this, it looked like, on the surface, a setup fight for Conor to win. Not the case. It was a really tough fight for him. I think looking back now, we could see there were a lot of factors going into that fight. One, I don't think he was prepared to deal with the size. He wasn't used to fighting the bigger guy. If you look at his previous opponents, he, were, he was fighting guys that were generally smaller than him. And I think beyond that, uh, something that most people don't really think about, yeah, it's 10 days notice, but it's also 10 days notice for Conor. He was preparing for a different fighter Correct. as well. So it's not like he was prepared to fight Nate Diaz. I think another thing that <laughs> that's kind of hard to to think of well it's hard to gauge from connor's perspective is who knows what nate diaz has been doing i mean it's a 50 50 shot if he's been in the gym going hardcore up in stockton or if he's just kind of been out smoking weed i mean you just yeah. <laughs> you never know what 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 he's been doing before the 10 days yeah so i think mentally for connor that was that was he didn't clearly connor spent the last what two three years really just running through competition mm -hmm. granted it was smaller um smaller size men but he's just built himself up in his mind that he's unbeatable at the time he, th he thought he, cr he truly thought he was unbeatable and, and the world was starting to come around and say he was unbeatable you know he, he had convinced me i had spent a lot of time really saying like all right let's wait just let, let's wait till he sees aldo let's wait till he sees aldo that's the champ you know that guy fights when he's when he's finally tuned when he's ready he's not gonna fight until he's ready he was ready and he got beat yeah. Quickly, so um, I think what so you just never know what what was going on in Connor's head when that switch was made. It probably he didn't give Diaz enough respect, 
honestly. He thought he thought he was going to go in there and, and all the things you just said. He thought he was going to take the champ down. He thought, all right, here's somebody who's just coming off the bench. I'm in peak performance. It doesn't matter who you put in front of me because I'm going to punch him in the face and it's not going to matter. Yeah, we, we really shouldn't diminish what Diaz was able to accomplish. I think in retrospect, a lot of people kind of look back and they're like, oh yeah, Diaz had this going for him and, and that. But there's a reason why most of the time people are going on short notice, they lose. It's, it's a really tough thing. It's hard to have a guy that goes through a camp, is prepared. Even if you're not prepared for a certain opponent, you, you're you a little bit more on point. You're, you've been working the mitts, you've been sparring, live sparring. So you are in peak physical condition. You know, you work out really hard and then you start tapering off so that you are just in prime fighting shape. Right. So it's crazy. At the time, 10 days notice Diaz, how can he possibly win? I think going into their rematch, it's it's been flipped, at least for the fans. It's, how can Connor possibly win when he lost against a 10, <laughs> like Nate Diaz on 10 days? Yeah, and I think that's, you're not giving Connor the athlete enough credit. I think he had, like, what do they say about the schoolyard? When a bully gets punched in the mouth, like, a lot of times, yeah, he'll, he'll go and hide, but then the bully kind of knows, like, oh, I can't be knocked out. I gotta take things more seriously. And I think that's exactly, like, Connor's an elite athlete. He just chose to go with MMA. He could do a number of things and be very successful at it. He's just one of those guys. He's, you know, there, there are guys who train and they work hard and they're awesome fighters. And Connor is just a phenomenal athlete who has great striking ability. So I think he's gonna put that together. He's gonna realize, hey, I really messed up last time. I can't do what I tried to do last time, which was basically punch Nick Diaz's head off. I can't do that. And I think he's got, okay, I don't know. Can he check that ego? Because that, that some, some people, you know, some some fighters fall in love with with knocking guys out, and it gets it gets fun, and, it, and there's no better way to kind of say I beat you, standing over a guy who's just been, you know, reduced to a puddle of mud, basically. So, can, has he learned that lesson? Can, can he say, look, what's more important is that I win, not the fashion that I win? It's one of the uh, fight analysts that I really like to listen to, Dan Hardy. He he brought that up. He was going to start running out of opponents and he would just he would just have to keep upping the challenge but he put that pressure on himself too because he kept upping the stakes at first it was i'm gonna beat this guy and then he beat the guy and then the next guy he was like i'm gonna beat this guy in the first round and then he beat the guy in the first round <laughs> yeah. then the next guy is like, i want to beat the guy in the first two minutes of the first round then he beat the guy in the first minute i'm gonna beat the next guy with a front kick and then he beat and it was like well eventually you're gonna you're gonna hit a wall there's gonna be there's gonna you're not gonna be able yeah. to race the stakes anymore or right. you're just gonna meet someone that's big and bad enough that can take that and take it to you right right one of the things about conor mcgregor that is a question mark for me how does this guy deal with adversity in the ring when you look at great fighters george st pierre against Connett, he got kicked in the head he was really badly hurt and he had to like come back from from that and then get to a victory. Anderson Silva, he got his butt kicked for four rounds, basically five rounds against Chael Sonnen. Just took him down and was grounding and pounding him. And then he pulled a submission victory at the very end. John Jones, he was pushed to the brink by Gustafson, came back, gutted it out. We haven't really seen Conor McGregor be able to gut it out. Either he loses and he's submitted or he's steamrolling through people. But right. we've yet to see a guy that challenges him and then he battles through, Response. guts it out. And I know the Max Holloway fight, it went the distance, but I think that had more to do with the fact that he has sustained a knee injury in the mm -hmm. fight. I think if he was completely healthy, he probably would have finished Max. Correct. We're just going to get into some of the nitty gritty real quick. Of course, McGregor trains up there with SVG Ireland. He's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Nate Diaz trains out there in Stockton with the Caesar Gracie fight team, and he is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Now, Diaz is a notorious slow starter, and we saw that in the first fight with Conor McGregor. Conor came out, and like you said, he was firing big guns, mm -hmm. not setting up anything. He was going haymaker after haymaker. He's a very intelligent fighter. Like, immediately after the fight, he was, I wasn't very economical with my energy. Right. I, I blew myself out. Now, Faraz Zahabi, uh, the coach up there at TriStar, he does a podcast, and he, he broke down this fight. And there's been a lot of people that said this is purely a cardio thing. He, he threw himself out. And Faraz was like, I don't think so. I don't think it's, it's all that. He, he said, if you look at him, because he went back and rewatched the fight, coming off the stool in the second round, his coach was like not even sweating it. It was like you on the first round, like you're right. going gonna to get this guy. He wasn't breathing heavy. Mm -hmm. If you look at him in the first two minutes of the second round, yeah, 
Connor was still looking fresh. Yeah. He was still throwing fire. It really wasn't until about the two minute mark when Nate hit him with that one two. So I think, yeah, part of the strategy didn't work. Like he threw himself out, but then also we need to credit Nate for being able to time his shots coming in and <clears throat> hurting him. Well, yeah, the other guy's a professional too. So it's not like, at the end of the day, the other guy's getting paid to do what he does for a living. So you can't sleep on folks. He did, he, he was crafty. He's a veteran. Like you said, he's a veteran of the UFC. He knows himself very well. He knew, you know, I can't go out there and blow my load in the first in the first five minutes anyway. Even, even him not being a notorious starter. He, he, he's, he was smart enough to know that, hey, I've got to really conserve myself and I have to pick my shot. And he timed it, he picked a shot, and it worked for him, that's how it looks like. Listening to his interviews afterwards, you know, Nate, he's just, I think that's the reason why fans like him so much. He's just, he's very honest. Uh, you know, he, he goes up <laughs> on these uh, rants, just like filled with profanities, but it, it's, it's kind of what makes him so endearing to uh, MMA fans. But he said afterwards that he didn't want to be outpointed and lose because he got tired. Mm -hmm. And he said a lot of guys, when they go in on short notice, they know they don't have a lot in the tank. They kind of fight conservatively. And then most of the time, they just like lose a five-round or three-round fight, whatever it is. And they just lose by decision. Yeah, look at uh, the Cormier, last Cormier fight when he fought Silva. That's exactly what you saw. So like Cormier was, was, was really preparing for another guy. Silva came in last minute, and Cormier just kind of leaned on him and, and grounded him out and was, like, the superior athlete. And, you know, the, the, the Silva got tired. That's it. That's that's what you expect. That's what you expect to see when this, this kind of thing pops up. To Nate's credit, he said that wasn't – he wasn't going to do that. He was right. going to stay in the pocket, and, like, he was like, I would rather have Connor knock me out. Like, I'd rather get knocked out and, like, lose because I was trying to win versus, yeah. like, just – Surviving. Survive and then lose. Let's, uh, let's talk about Nate a little bit. This guy, he has a, he does a really good job of pressuring his opponent, both with presence and pace. He's a long fighter, but he excels fighting in the pocket. His one-two is some of the best in the UFC. Connor knows that at this point. That, that, that's a really <laughs> slick combination. The, the cool thing about Nate Diaz is you, you wouldn't really, you wouldn't say like his defense is the best defense uh, in the UFC. But he, is, he does a fairly good job. The reason why his offense is so good is because he will stay in the pocket. He is hittable. Uh, he likes to roll with the punches, uh, sort of roll, retract. He likes to do that rock back counter where, you know, he leans forward pretty heavily anyways. He's on his lead leg a lot, and that's how he sits down and really gets power into those shots. But when, he, when he's leaning forward, his face is right there. His opponents are like, ah, oh, it's right, I just want to punch it. And you saw... Connor over and over again threw that straight down the middle, but he was only kind of clipping him because mm -hmm. Nate was like moving back and he really kind of messes with his opponent's sense of distance and timing because he's so long and he can kind of move back like that. But he does do it in, in a fairly predictive manner. In the past, opponents have been able to capitalize on that and maybe throw a kick as he's moving back into that rock back and be able to hit him. Connor didn't really do that. Connor, strangely enough, he has a, you know, we've talked about Conor McGregor on this podcast a few times now. And the thing we always bring up is his diversity of strikes, mainly his kicks. But for some reason, he went into that fight and all of a sudden he started doing like power shots. He, that he was, wanted to be a boxer. He, he wanted the, you know, yeah, he wanted he wanted the sexy knockout, I guess. To, to I think a little bit, like Conor, I mean, you can't get that that good without being just supremely confident, like bordering around like arrogance. Yeah. He, he probably was saying to himself, I will show the world I can beat Nate at Nate's game. I could see that. I mean, that's the, the like the John's Jonesification of everything where he's like, you're really good at that. I'm not, but I'm going to be better by the time we meet. Yeah. And I'm going to show you that I'm better and I'm going to show the world. And that's, you know, that's what got Rousey in trouble. She was trying to, she was trying to bang with Holmes, you know, a few championship fights ago now. Um where she thought she could really be a Swiss Army knife and, and take take people down the way they do. And it's ego. At that point, these guys are really, I don't know if they become bored with just winning all the time and they have to make up a new way and challenge themselves or if it's just flat ego. And ego will get you in trouble, man. I mean, yeah. it's a fight. It's a fight every time. This isn't this isn't boxing. There aren't guys that are going to go 50 and 0. It's, it's not going to happen. Everybody in here has a chance. And, and there's so many different ways to beat people and so many different styles and so many different, you know, skill sets that... Anybody can, can do it on any day. I mean, I know the uh, the adage in football is any given Sunday, but really, any given fight night, man, it's 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 liable to go down clearly, which is what 
you saw when when Diaz took down Conor McGregor when everybody kind of universally picked Conor McGregor. So going into that first fight, and we we've, we've seen this in previous fights, Conor has a way of getting under his opponent's skin, winning the mental game. Correct. We saw this against Aldo. We saw Brandau get really upset with him. We saw Poirier get really upset with him. Like, guys that generally don't speak out like that. Mm-hmm. And then you see them animated. Uh, at the weigh-ins, you see them animated or angry, getting over there. He's messing with them. And in many ways, uh, a lot of people, I think Luke Thomas may have pointed this out, but you, it's almost like that's round one. If, you, if you're winning all of those exchanges, you're basically winning round one. So when you see Connor step into the cage to actually fight in the first round, to him, it's the second round up one. Yeah. And that's why he's so relaxed and so confident because he's broken those guys. And Nate actually called him out for this. When he beat, uh, when he beat Michael Johnson, he went, on there, he went on that rant that Fox had to bleep out the entire <laughs> thing. And he, he basically said, you already beat all of those other guys before they stepped in the cage with you. They, you already knew you were going to beat them, but you, you don't know you're going to beat me. I'm not going to crack like, like them. Like, you'll have to actually beat me in the cage to beat me. I'm the real fight. It turned out that was true. Yeah. Diaz is not one of those guys that's going to break from that. So my question to you is how much of that mental warfare game, how much of that's even going to factor in for the second go around? We've noticed Connor really has toned down his trash talking leading up to this fight. Yeah, I think it's already had its effect. I think Nate's basically said, look, it's not going to work. So don't, Connor's just not going to waste his own time. He also, I think there's something to be said for this little battle with his kind of faux retirements that he's had going on with the UFC. I think. You know, a lot of what he, he's a smart businessman. Ultimately, he understands business very well. He understands brand. He understands what he does and he understands his value to the UFC. He knows they're trying to sell or have sold. I don't, I don't even know what the, what's, what's going on with them right now. They have sold? Yeah, for Okay. So, anyway, what he's, he's kind of figured out is all this is doing is putting money into the pockets of the UFC. And he's not really about that. He's about Conor McGregor, which is why you see him really going out there and sparring verbally with like Floyd Mayweather. He's not wasting his time on UFC guys anymore because ultimately it's not going to put any more money in his pocket and it's not going to build the brand of Conor. It's as big, I'd, I'd say it was as big as it was going to be before the Nate Diaz fight. Now he has to do a little more work to rebuild that thing and, and I think beating Nate Diaz will do that. I think it'll, it'll, he'll, you'll see, you'll see old Conor right back at it again if he, if he wins this and it's not one of these guys that, that, that talks just because he's not a bad loser. I mean, he, 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 he faced the music. He said, hey, I lost. He's a better man today. You know, all the things that he said. He said all the right things. Kind of the things that you wanted to hear him say, a humbled man say. Um, but I think he just knows it's wasted energy at this point because, one, it's not going to work on Nate Diaz, and two, it's not going to put money in his pockets. It doesn't matter. So he, the fight's going to sell itself. There's nothing that he needs to do that's going to make it, you know, any bigger. People are already anticipating it. People want to see, hey, can he do it? Um, I think people are I, – I, I, I'm cheering for him. I mean, we'll, we can cut straight to the – to the choice. I'm, I, I want him to do it. I've, I've just never liked the Diaz brothers in general. And a lot of people really, you know, kind of, kind of, are they're about that life. And they really, like, if you're a Diaz guy, you're a Diaz guy. And like, you like yeah. everything about him. And, and I don't mind him. I mean, he's not bad. But like, between the two, give me, give me Connor, man. I, li- I like his, I like his style. I like his approach. I like his, his, his attitude uh, a little more. You know, he's, they're, they're, they're cut from the same cloth. They're, they talk they, shit. They, they really are. Sorry. And I think they've sort of recognized that. There's a mutual respect there. I, I noticed that when they first had their press conference for their first fight. Mm-hmm. And Connor started saying his stuff. And Nate's brought this up in interviews after the fight. But he was like, it surprised him. He was like, did you? Did you write this stuff down? Like, do you have, like, insults that you like, oh, that's a good one. And you wrote it down. And <laughs> he was like, this sounds so fake. Like, what did, like, you were a different person. All of a sudden, you got the mic and you started saying all this stuff. Like, he was like, Is, are, I'm sorry, where's my script? Like, what do I say? <laughs> right? And then he was just like, you know, like, I don't give it, like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Just, like, yelling it back at, at Connor and telling him he was playing touch button to park and, and all that stuff. And you could kind of see Connor go, whoa. And it was like, oh, you're not going to be one of those guys that will just let me clown you, yeah. are you? You're, you're, you're different. And I think there's a mutual respect there. They're both sort of uh, anti-establishment in a way. Nate and his brothers, they've always been kind of like that. They've yeah. always been in the UFC's like, you can never find house. Them, you can never find them pre-fight. You can never yeah. find yeah. And even with... Even after they've won, they've had like their scuffle. Remember, they were supposed to fight at UFC 200, and then they right. redid the contract. And when Connor showed up at the hotel, it was like this whole big thing. Like Twitter, like took pictures of him in this fancy hotel with Dana White, signed a new contract for 202. 
And then the tweets that came about Nate, it was like, uh, Dana White's like really upset with like Nate and stuff. And it's like, <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, that's the way it's gonna work with these guys. They kind of they kind of scratch that that similar itch, I think. Yeah. Uh, before I give my predictions, I do want to point out that this is I, I have to respect Connor. Not only does he want to run it back with the same set of circumstances, this is a fight that. SBG did not want him to take. The camp went back and they were like, this is not a good fight for you. He's hard stylistically. He's a bigger guy. Mm -hmm. And this does absolutely nothing for you. It's not for a belt. It doesn't help you in any ranking. You're the champion in your weight division. This doesn't help you for the lightweight rankings. And right. you're not a future welterweight. So they didn't like the fight for him, but he was like, no, I, I got to do this. I got to avenge that one, you know, that one loss. So I, I got to give, I got to give him credit for that. Prediction time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say I, I, I see, I think this fight can be a really, really good fight. Maybe one of the best fights that we'll see this year. Both the fighters, they just, they tend to want to like meet in the middle of the octagon and they like to pressure forward. Neither of them really likes to go backwards. So that means that they're going to have a lot of pocket exchanges. So we're going to see some pretty awesome strikes. I think we're going to see a little bit more of a patient Connor, a more diverse array of attack from him. Probably gonna throw in some of those leg kicks because the DS brothers are notoriously bad at checking leg kicks. And maybe try different strikes. In that first fight, McGregor, it looked like it was like, like rock'em sock'em robots. He had the <laughs> he had the uppercut and then the, the, the cross. And those are like punches he threw. He was spamming them. It was like playing a guy like on a video game. He was just yeah. spamming the same one-two combination and stuff. And every once in a while, he throws that capoeira kick that has like no chance of landing. <laughs> uh, Connor, I think he, even though he's the smaller guy, he's he's got the power advantage over Nate. I think he's the guy that could sleep Nate. I, I have a hard time seeing Nate knock out Connor uh, at any point in this fight. Yeah. So I see it. First two rounds, if the if the fight stops in the first two rounds, I really see that favoring Connor. I think if once he gets to a third round, it's anyone's game. And if he goes in the championship rounds, I really do see it favoring Diaz. He's just a naturally bigger guy. It's it's that economy of energy. He's uh, at a full camp. Yeah, and the big guy is just able to like move with <clears throat> that weight a little bit better, especially when he goes into later rounds, whereas a smaller guy, maybe you put on some muscle, you're gonna fatigue a yeah. little bit. So that's the way I see it. I, I guess if it goes to decision, I see this going Diaz. I have a feeling McGregor, I mean, he's just, he brought in, an art. he's described it as an army. He's spared no expense. He built himself a gym in Vegas to train for this fight, state-of-the-art equipment, all of these like high-ranking boxers and grapplers that he's like just put full time. He like actually rented out a place for them to live just to be right there on call, training with him. You know, we, this, you know what this sounds like. What? It sounds like Rocky One. It sounds like he's. Oh no, no. When was Ivan Drago? Rocky Four. <laughs> Just like state of the art equipment. Well, Dra guess, Drago. So Drago would be uh, Connor. Would be Connor. The, the, the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like and like Nate Diaz is like changing tires and like I don't know whatever whatever like. <laughs> <laughs> just like working, working at a, working at a, at, on transmissions and like, like, just like getting old man strength. Just a real, real salt of the earth, real salt of the earth guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna segue real quick. Have you seen the? Uh, it was like Ben Affleck's commentary on Armageddon. It's like on the DVD when you can have like the guy, the actors like. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I've never listened to it, but I'm, I'm familiar with a with the commentary. It's hilarious. You need to watch this and for all you listeners out there. I'll, I'll put a link down so that you guys can listen to it. But it's just uh, the whole salt of the earth, like this hardened American guy that like works on transmissions and stuff like that. It's it's funny because he was talking about how he went up to Michael Bay and was like. This is really stupid. Why, why would you train oil guys to go into space? It's so much easier to train astronauts <laughs> from NASA to learn the drill. And he was like, "No, don't worry. It's like a, it's like a real plan." He's like, "What do you mean? It's a real plan? Like if I went to NASA, this is a real plan?" He's like, "No, but it's like, it's like a real thing." It's like, "No, just because you wrote it down didn't make it real." And like they're having to see, and he's like, "This is so stupid." Because like right now, the scientist is basically questioning whether or not they should send someone like Bruce Willis up there. Bruce is like, "Oh, what happens if a transmission breaks? You won't know what to do. We've been trained to do that." It's like, "Guy's a goddamn scientist. <laughs> I think he can figure it out." <laughs> what What happens right. if like the you know like your your astronaut suit like malfunctions? <laughs> what are you gonna do then? <laughs> I, so. Yeah, I'm gonna go check into that immediately. <laughs> Armageddon, I'm write it down. Um, <laughs> oh, that's, that's hilarious. The Rocky Four, Rocky Four analogy. 
Yeah, he, McGregor, no, he really has spared no expense. He still has Idol Portal and Mike Dolce on the payroll, so that's like $50,000 a week for pool noodles and avocados. <laughs> Wait, who's doing his uh, his movement? Is he having a movement that, that's coach? That's Idol Portal. Okay, that's his <laughs> the movement same coach. Guy. <laughs> the, move, the, the guy that he plays touch butt with in the park. <laughs> <laughs> so that's... <laughs> We'll see, but you know, maybe he says that this, he really got to take time to focus and no joke, he really has spent so much time promoting the organization for like the last few years, does mm -hmm. all of these different commercials. All the press junkets. Yeah, it, and this is the first time he's really said, no, I'm gonna train, I'm gonna like focus on being a fighter, you know, the thing that got me here. Yeah. So I'm really interested to see like, can a great fighter even improve even more? Maybe we'll see the best McGregor yet, and he just puts on one of those all-time performances. I'm hoping. That's yeah. That that's for more than cheering for a guy. I want I want greatness. I want to see greatness. That's what you want to see. Even even you know, I want to see what they what they can do. I, you know, it's hard to see somebody else winning all the time, but like, you want to see when somebody can put it together. That's why. Hey, I know we're, I'm jumping ahead again, but like this Golden State stuff, I, it, I'm really like jazzed about. I like greatness, and I think it's an opportunity for Connor to really show he is that next level athlete, that transcendent athlete that can really um, kind of show who he is and what he is made of. I agree with you completely, and not to discount Nate Diaz at all. He's a hell of a fighter, very, very talented in his own right. If he won, this isn't like a McGregor sucks night. Nate, there's, Agreed. N Nate Diaz is a, a very good fighter, and also confidence is very important. To a fighter, and this guy, his last fight, he slayed the dragon. Yeah, he, he called out the biggest name on the UFC roster and submitted him. Yeah, so uh, his confidence got to be an all time high, and that's got to be working in his favor. Though he's the guy that had the whole had the brunt of the promotional responsibility this, time, this go yeah. around, so we'll see if that took a toll on him. It's good to see Bad <laughs> that, Blood, man. It's just that's it's good to see it. Yeah, cue it. Cue the song. Cue the Tay-Tay. Bad Blood. That's actually what they're calling it. Are they? That's what they call it. Oh, that that's works out. Bad Blood. <laughs> Man, look at that. Wait, are you? do you secretly work on the UFC promotional stuff? <laughs> I've got enough going on right now. I don't have time for that. That's right. Too many pet projects for this guy. You can't afford me. Too many pet projects for this guy. <laughs> Next, I want to talk briefly about Tyrone Woodley, who just shocked the world when he beat Robbie Lawler at UFC 201. Robbie Lawler has just looked phenomenal. Though, I guess in retrospect, a lot of people were talking about it, but he, it had to catch up to him eventually. This guy was going into wars. The Robbie Lawler was the champ, but every single title defense, it those were like five round fights, and they were absolute wars with Condit, with McDonald. It's like you, you lose a little bit of your life force or something. You know, you lose <laughs> years off of your life every single time you go through something like that. I don't know if this that that fight demonstrated that that had accumulated and that it finally took its toll because it was one of those really quick flash knockouts. And mm -hmm. Tyron Woodley, he has that ability that he, he's just super strong. He has that absolute pure KO power. So you can do that to anybody. So we shouldn't discount Robbie Lawler too much, but congratulations to Tyron Woodley. Uh, strangely enough, they actually had Stephen Thompson, who is the current number one contender in the welterweight division, having just beaten Rory McDonald himself in a very impressive fashion. He's a boy scout. He's very nice. He's very polite. And he, he just asked Woodley, hey, you look really good. You're the new champ. Congratulations. Any chance that you and I could maybe get it on this November? And of course, the answer should be yes. I'll take on anybody. I'm the champ. And he said, no, I think maybe there are other fights that might look good for you, but right now I'm looking to make that money, and I want to fight Nick Diaz. He's fresh off of his suspension, so he's, he's looking to book his first fight. So he called Nick Diaz, and then Dana White kind of looked like he was putting his foot down, like, no, 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 Stephen Thompson, he's the number one contender. He's going to get the next title shot. And then Tyrone Woodley releases text messages that, he has been sending to George St. Pierre, and I guess the two of them have gotten chummy and are like, oh yeah, let's fight next. We'll totally make a bunch of money. How do you feel about this, Brian? I know you used to be a boxing fan, and this is something that happens in boxing quite a lot, where fighters sort of steer their career. And it's it's also a little bit different, because for boxing, your value is so tied to your own brand. You have seen... Once, uh, once you get to a certain level, that's true. But for the most part, everyone kind of gets like a, the same standard pay. Correct. It, it's it's almost like you know you go to work, you clock in, and it's whoever is assigned to you. This is who I fight next. Good. Yeah. You do it, and that's across the board. That's how it happens. 
How do you feel about fighters trying to... The way I really see this, it's a labor issue. And a lot of the times, I you know, I side with management. Just, just the way I see things, the way things break down for a number of reasons, through personal experiences, all these kinds of things. But when it comes to professional sports, for some reason, I always... And maybe because they're out there more, and I, I, I kind of have a connection to the actual athletes, I side much more with... The athletes, and like you said, yes, I, I did kind of grow up a boxing fan, and that's much more prevalent in, in where they're choosing their own. Now, where you get into trouble is when they start handpicking their own guys, and you know they're bringing up, you know, uh, young fighters like Canelo Alvarez, who was brought up, and they really cherry pick fights for him to make sure that they, they kept that pristine, you know, 26, 27, 28 no record, so that by the time he, you know, clearly he was a talent, um, but it can get you in trouble where it doesn't make you the best fighter you can be, which ultimately seems to be what the UFC is really trying to go for most of the time. I think they're really trying to put out like a meritocracy where they're saying, hey, you earned it, you fought this guy, you're the number one contender, now is your time. It doesn't matter that you were lined up to fight, you know, the other champion and the champion just got knocked off. Now you move up from two to one, one moves up to, to champion, and, and that's the next fight that we want to see. Um, but what I think is, is, is important is that there, there should be a little bit given to the champion because it's not it's not a forever reign and as long as he is not actively trying to duck people and maybe this is something that's going on in the back rooms where they can have a negotiation where they say hey you have this fight you'll have more say over the next fight or say hey this is the fight you know them being the UFC saying this is the fight that we need this is the fight that we have in our cards this is where you all are all your training schedule are lined up we can get this fight on this card so this is going to make it but if you win this one will let you pick your next one. And that's just him being the young guy and not really understanding how the business works. You can't just go out there. I mean, there, there are rules. And, and of anybody, the UFC is just like, they modeled themselves after the NFL. Like, they're, you know, they're, they're really, like, tight-lipped about what they do and who is in control of everything. So right down to, to what they were anymore, I mean, I, I thought that was a big loss whenever they, they had to go, everybody had to go Reebok because I thought that was the one kind of advantage that you had as a fighter to make money for yourself. You know, you, you could have your own, you know, it looks... It looked crazy, but the UFC, like, I mean, MMA, it's, it, it is crazy, man. It's not the, the eye gouging that it used to be, but it was a little bit, you know, kind of like, it was a little alt. It was a little sh shifted, and, I, and I, I dug that about it. And now it's, it's very corporate. It's very polished. It's very professional. They've got it going on, honestly. And, you know, they, they had ulterior motives that, you know, we, we've talked about earlier where they sold. But honestly, I think it's just him really needing to, to learn the game a little bit. You know, he stepped in. Yes, yes, you are champion, but guess what man there are 14 weight classes you're, you're not the grand champion you're not you know Conor McGregor can pull this kind of stuff because he's had fight after fight after fight big money fight you can't you know you can't come in and, and say this is how it's going to be there's a new sheriff in town I think it, it was a little naive um, but ultimately I, I am I am I like that he's trying to do it you know maybe maybe he'll take that you know he'll take that fight back to the back behind closed doors and, and have a little leverage and, and he can figure out who he wants to fight next yeah, I, th I think as fans, we appreciate what the UFC does. We like the fact that they force the best to fight right. the best. And we do kind of just take that for granted, like, oh, yeah, that's how it happens. But combat sports, traditionally, you got you have a management team behind the fighter, too. Yeah. And there there is – things have to make business sense. Like, Mayweather has made a career – and you, we were talking off the air about this, but you were like – he made a career of fighting guys that were just slightly before their prime or maybe Correct. slightly after their prime, but at the perfect time to cash in for the biggest value. Correct. Um, which is why, you know, I'm Hispanic, grew up traditionally watching Hispanic fighters. So I was never really big into, into heavyweights, but watched uh, a guy named Julio Cesar Chavez when I was growing up, and he just, he fought everybody. That guy, The guy won 99 fights in a row. He might have won 102 fights in a row. And he just like... No, whatever. It was all these guys that were like during their prime, during his prime. He was like he was gonna bang it out with them, and that was something that was passed along to Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar De La Hoya is not really remembered too well these days because he had a lot of losses late in his career because he was still willing to fight people, which is mm -hmm. what I really respected about him a lot. You know, he got embarrassed by Pacquiao, he got destroyed by Bernard, he got beat by Floyd Mayweather, he got you know beat by Felix Schoen. and these were all late losses that kind of tarnished his. His legacy, but what it did was it ingratiated him into the fight community. Now he owns Golden Boy Promotions, and now he is just making bank for everything that like Floyd Money Mayweather wants to say. Like those checks are coming from somewhere, and I want to see the cat, the, the, the checks that like Golden Boy is is, <laughs> is, is is cashing, not the ones that Floyd Money Mayweather is cashing. I mean, it's all impressive. There's money to spare. I mean, you 
everybody's getting rich as long like as long as like people continue to want to see guys like go hand to hand and fighting whatever the format whatever the rules whatever you know it's going to be popular because that's the ultimate test there's there's no pure competition or sport it's one against one me against you and by rules or by knockout one of us is leaving here as a declared winner and it's 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 the best yeah to, to me the the ultimate form of competition correct really so um yeah i mean as a fan you do want your fighters to just take on all comers anybody that they want to fight bring it on if you can make the fighters comfortable and give them a voice as well you can extend careers you know you're gonna have happier fighters ultimately that'll lead to a better product UFC just they don't play favorites even for Conor McGregor I mean he was kicked off the 200 card because of his pseudo retirement not wanting to do the press and they were just like well then we're yanking you off the card and that's Conor McGregor the biggest name in the sport UFC is like we, UFC first brand first correct. fighter second correct and that's so that's that's where a lot of these labor disagreements come through it's like who's, who's gonna blink first is is Tyrone willing to say, I am willing to give up this championship if you're not going to let me fight who I want to fight. And that's the only card he has. And it's 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 a suicide pill. Like, he can take it, and he can realize very quickly how little the UFC actually needs him. I think that's ultimately what it's going to come down to. Like, he, he can try and pull it, and he can try and do what he wants. But ultimately, maybe he's big enough that people would make a stink that, like, hey, he wants to fight somebody, he wants to fight, and they're not letting him. I don't see it breaking down that way. I don't see fans really getting up in arms about him because somebody will fill in. He'll come to his senses. He'll fight again, and you know, there's too many. There's too many studs in that division, anyways. Correct. So, and a lot of lot of great fights to be made. Now, it should be pointed out that the UFC, from time to time, they will throw in head scratchers. We got Dan Henderson against Michael Bisping. Henderson, to say he's past his prime is a bit of an understatement. Um, the fact that he gets a title shot. When he was, I don't even know if he was currently in the top 10. That raises some eyebrows, but that fight has history. This is a guy, he, he knocked him out. My, uh, he knocked out Michael Bisping at UFC 100, and that knockout was actually his logo, the silhouette of him punching Michael Bisping <laughs> to, into, the, into the ground was his like official logo for so long. So they have, a, they have some history, um, bad blood between the two. So it's, it's fun to see him run it back, even though it's... Uh, you know, it's 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 past his prime. You know, the the UFC, I think they do listen to the fans and they do throw in fan favorite fights. Like Connor Nate is a very yeah. good example of a fan favorite. Good fight. for them. Good for them, man. Knowing what the people want, and that's what it is. Knowing what the people want and doing your best to give it to them. If you're going to continue to do that, hey, sign me up. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll I'll come over here. We'll go to the bar. We'll we'll watch it. It'll 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 get yeah, eyeballs. We'll get the UFC fight pass. And, yeah, they. <laughs> They got the Mizugaki, Garbrandt. We didn't really talk too much about like the rest of the card. I'll just, I just want to throw in their UFC 202, the co-main event of Anthony Johnson, Textura. That's a hell of a fight. Uh, two just heavy-handed strikers, both with incredible knockout power. We're not gonna really get into that fight, but I'm just gonna call it. I think I see Anthony Johnson winning that fight. And now we're gonna move on to the final portion of this podcast. The NBA and the summer of crazy spending. The cap increased by 32%, going from 70 million from last year to 94.14 million this summer. And people went crazy. I'm gonna throw in some of the, I'm just gonna throw out there some of the names that were moved around. The biggest, Kevin Durant, to Golden State Warriors. Obviously. We had Dwayne Wade going home to Chicago. I'm we had home. We had Horford go to the Celtics and Dwight Howard signing with the Hawks. Another the Grizzlies home. got Chandler Parsons along with handing Conley the <sighs> biggest contract currently in the Mike NBA. Mike Conley. <laughs> the best Mike Conley, the best player in the NBA. <laughs> 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 I mean, okay, when you put it that way. And then we had a couple trades, uh, big trades. New York traded for Derrick Rose. Yeah. And Orlando traded for Serge. Finally making them a uh, super team, Dave according Baca. to, uh, <laughs> according to yeah. Derrick Rose, the other super team. The other super team. And then just... Uh, Sorry, I, I talked over you. You said Ibaka. Where did he go? Down to Orlando? Ba- down to Orlando. That was a... 
curious move. I'd, I'd like to talk about that one, but continue. Sorry. Okay. And then just to uh, to round out the uh, Texas Triangle Trio, we have the Dallas Mavericks. They sign Harrison Barnes to a max contract and pick up Andrew Bogut from the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, so yeah. it's like they're the Golden State Warriors light. <laughs> we got San Antonio Spurs. They lost Dial, picked up Pau Gasol. It's a good pickup for the yeah, Spurs, especially with Tim Duncan retiring. That surprises nobody. <laughs> And then the Rockets, we, uh, you know, you guys wanted to become the Golden State Warriors, but we wanted to become the New Orleans Pelicans <laughs> without Anthony Davis. <laughs> we got ourselves Ryan Anderson and Eric Gordon. Uh, I think the biggest move for the summer for the Rockets was actually a surprising extension for James Harden. He could have waited a couple years and really tested the free market and got himself a bigger deal, but he went ahead and extended. So that was that was cool to, to yeah. lock up our. Uh, our star player. Let's just get into it. Let's start with the big, the big one. The 73 and 9 Golden State Warriors adding former MVP Kevin Durant. This is bonkers. What are we expecting this year? Are they can they can they get 80? Can they break 80? <laughs> Yes. The answer is yes. The answer is, okay, could they roll off 40 in a row? Sure. Why not? I mean, they only have to go to San Antonio twice. So even yeah. if they split that one, that's 81. Yeah. I mean, okay, where's their other loss coming from? I mean, uh, yeah, if, if this Dallas team stays... Dallas clearly. They got, the, they got the first one on last year. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Well, after Milwaukee. Oh, that's right. Milwaukee Milwaukee, Milwaukee broke the streak. Um, oh, but you guys blew them out, though. We right? did. Uh, like a 20. stepless. We, we blew out a step. And, and this, this really all comes down... It may not even be injury proof anymore. Like maybe they just injury proofed themselves. Yeah. Like that that that's what they did. I don't think Yeah, Steph Curry can be hurt and that's still the best team in the league. Yeah, and I think they may understand it, it The question was can they? Yes. The question uh, will they? No. No, they I think they're they they may kind of understand um, the Spurs approach. They may really say, "Hey, our time to shine. We need to figure out how to peak for the playoffs. That's what we need to do because they're going to go out there and, and you know, kind of what you said earlier. Like they're they're going to they're going to be in somebody's. They're taking everybody's best shot. They did it for an entire year. Did it wear them down? Did it? I don't know. But they they you know they 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 choked. They choked away three games at the end to like by by poking the bear by saying you know and and not even by their own doing it's just the world kind of saying like Steph Curry is unlike anybody else and you could kind of see LeBron in the corner saying hey guys don't forget about don't forget about me and it really seemed like he he, he did seem like he was kind of picking on Steph like like a schoolyard bully and like really wanting to show everybody but also show Steph Curry like no man oh yeah what he like blocked him and yeah, like, and got up like, in his yeah. face yeah just like no like he, here's the deal i'm 6'8 i'm taller i'm faster i'm stronger like I am the Olympics, <laughs> like bigger, faster, stronger. Like it's it's LeBron James. So, I'm I'm, you know, we talked about this earlier, wanting to see greatness. Like, yeah, let's see it. Let's see what you got. I would love to see them go for it. No chance they will because they just they they burned themselves out. I really truly think they burned themselves out last year, and ultimately it left them a game short. And they're not a laughing stock. Nobody's laughing at the at the at the Thunder. Um, but it was a curious move. It's a curious move to see Durant sign with the team that ended his season, came back on him. You know, the, it, it could be said that, like, maybe Oklahoma City would have been a better matchup and, and could have potentially won. They, they were, you know, a game away from being in the finals three times, and they, they choked it away. Who knows how that goes out, but they'd already beat the Spurs. They took Golden State to the brink. There's no, no saying they couldn't beat, you know, the, the Cavs, so... It's gonna be a great season. I'm, I'm so curious to see how how Golden State responds, and they could come out on a mission again and say, "Hey, like we didn't get it done. We're gonna show that we can win more games. We're gonna go for 75 games, yeah. and we're gonna really like run through the playoffs as well." Because I mean, they just what if like Durant decides mm, I just kind of want to come off the bench. Like oh, we don't have to like we don't need breaks because we have like two gas pedals, so we're just gonna like yeah. <laughs> It's incredible the different lineups that they can put out there and just the star power that they have. It's it's really something else. Refresh me. Who's their big man now? Well, they got Draymond Green. I think they picked up Zaza Pachulia. 
It's a nice uh, switch. No. We we they give up they, we gave up uh, Jaza Pachulia. Yeah, yeah you they guys, did. You're you, correct. We you, gave, we gave him up. <laughs> you guys traded. Um, you guys traded Pachulia for uh, <laughs> basically in effect. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, not in what is the center anymore? I mean, you kind of want to say it's outdated, but with so many young good players, you know, that we'll probably get to, you know, Carl Anthony Towns, Anthony Davis. I mean, there's just it's not dead, and 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 sports in general, like it just takes one to kind of do something, and then it's copycat. They're all copycat leagues. Like, oh, we're going to add two tight ends, so everybody's going to go out and start drafting tight ends. Oh, hey, we're going to have small ball, so everybody's going to have, like, a, a really, like, uh, formidable five who's, like, can do everything. They want they want to find a Draymond Green. Um, and eventually it'll come back, and the big man will be, like, he'll, he'll be back. I don't think it's, you know, nothing's going to go too far one direction before somebody finds a competitive advantage with something else, I think. I also think, like, that's the way that you you would attack Golden State. Absolutely. Be bigger. Ball. You be gotta bigger. be big and you yeah. gotta out rebound them and you gotta pound it down low and slow down the game. Yeah. You know what you what you could see is just like I'd love to see like two thousand four Detroit. You know, where it's just like ugly basketball. Yeah. Ugly, horrible basketball that just scoring seventy four points a game and like just beating opponents to a pulp and like keeping the score so low and making it like a battle every time you go out. That's what it's gonna take. And you probably don't want to kick Rashid Wallace in the nuts. Because <laughs> he will straight up shoot you. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, grief. Yeah, Rashid Wallace and Ben Wallace. Dad, those are two guys you just really didn't want to mess with. No, not Cha- Chauncey Billups, as your, as your point guard, was like, that dude's menacing too, man. Yeah, he he was, just he looks like tough. a junkyard dog, man. Yeah. Like, that team was that team was really good. And I, I think that's going to, something will come along. Someone will say, hey, like, there aren't any more like really athletic, you know, D and three guys. There's only so many D and three guys that we can have. So many shooters we can space out. Like, but there's a s ton of like really good, solid defenders, big bulking guys, and like we're gonna go to battle with that. And you know, we're we're Thibodeau. Like let, let let's see him kind of like you know put that together somewhere. Yeah, it, Golden State and the Thunder, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Those were like the two teams that they kind of went with. We'll be bad, and we're okay with being bad, and we'll just develop our young talent. Mm-hmm. And for the Thunder, they had Green, they had Westbrook, they had Durant, Ibaka, and th- those were their guys. James Harden, mm-hmm. those were their guys, and that was like their future. And that was that's what you get when you <laughs> suck for a really long time. You get back to back to back to back top five picks. Go. Mm. What's Sorry up? to cut you off, which is not like to say, you have, you also have to be smart, and they have they both have really good front offices because like, I don't know what the Sixers are doing. The Sixers are trying it, yeah, and they're they're really collecting, like young talent. But are they hitting? That's what we're gonna find out. Like, are they hitting on their, you know, Minis- I think Minnesota's doing a much better job of it than yeah. than the Sixers right now. Um, but you're absolutely right. They're what they, what they did. I mean, the names you just rattled off were just like. Those are all-star teams. That like that that Oklahoma City. This just it's a talent farm, man. It's really impressive what they were able to do. Um, but continue, sorry. Yeah, they hit really well, and also pieces that fit. You know, I think the problem with Philadelphia is like you have three really good players on your team that all play the same position. You drafted three centers back to back to back. Yeah. Now they went with best player available. You can't fault them. Let them see which one starts, and then maybe trade one. Yeah, for they're assets. That, that's assets. That's, that, that's fine. It's and a then Daryl Morey of a yeah. of a of the NBA. And then they just got a Ben Simmons, who's yeah, they're yeah, of I mean, all those guys, that's their their best chance at having a franchise player. Right. You have Golden State Warriors. You know, over the years they were able to pick up Clay Thompson, uh, Harrison Barnes, Steph Curry, Draymond Green. Like they too suck for yeah, a while. but not even. I mean, so. Draymond Green, where was he? Was he a second rounder? or Was he a late first rounder? I mean, he's not. He's not. He's not a lottery guy. He's not a lottery guy. That's Steph just Curry, Serge Ibaka, same thing. They were yeah. both late first rounders. Yeah, Steph Curry. He was the seventh pick. I mean, it wasn't like he came out of Davidson. It's not like he came out of Duke and was like, oh yeah, this guy like was like gonna be really really good. Like, no, he he tore it up and he was really good in college and, and made a couple really spectacular runs. I remember. Um, but you know, you, you forget he had he had wonky ankles. Really, people were really kind of scared away from him. That's why he didn't go. Maybe. Top four, top three. He he went and he, he fell all the way to number seven. So it is, it is kind of being it is kind of being lucky. It's being nineteen ninety seven San Antonio Spurs. I mean, like they were yeah. really good, you know, for like eight years before that. Yeah. Everybody got hurt and they get Tim Duncan. Like that's you 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 get a transcendent player and in the NBA more than any other sport, it has it has a profound effect on your franchise. 
it's even different for them because with Tim Duncan, that was undisputably the best player yeah. in that draft class. Everyone knew he was probably going to at least be a good player. If right. not, he had the potential to be a great player, and, and he ended up being you know Hall of Famer, uh, best power forward of all time. There was – you're right. Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, there was – they didn't know those were going to hit. They didn't know Steph Curry was going to hit the, that way. And the first few years, you're right, with the injuries and everything. To me, he looked like a solid player. He went like from one year being this guy is a good player, probably like a third-team All-NBA guy. That and, and he'll probably be like there, maybe hover <laughs> below that, maybe have a really good season and be second. Like, But that's where he's at. Not This is the best player in the NBA, by the way. How they didn't trade Kevin Love for Kevin Love, how they, didn't, how they had the foresight – to keep Clay Thompson and say, no, we're going to hitch our wagon to that horse. I mean, had, uh, this is why, like, laymen are not GMs, because, like, I think you, you you take a straw poll of just, like, geeks on the streets, and they're saying, yeah, pull the trigger on that. Like, look, look, at, look at, he seems to fit exactly what they want. And not only did they, like, get what they would have gotten with Love, but they got, they're so much better. They're so much better than they ever could have been with Kevin Love. Now, I mean, are they, you know, Kevin Love just won a championship over him. Maybe not. Maybe I'm speaking out of, you know. Um, but, you know, he, he wasn't too much. He didn't, he didn't have too much to do with that. But they, it's, it's just having that commitment to your plan and seeing it through and yeah. being rewarded. Also, I don't think offense was their problem. Right. It, it was defense. And, you know, Draymond Green does a really good job uh, at that power forward position. Short for, to be a traditional power forward, but he's, he's – you know, he's thick and he's wide. So he's a Charles Barkley knock throwback man. I mean, yeah. just like, uh, Charles Barkley wasn't 6'4". I six mean, four, everybody yeah. thinks that, like, you think of him when he played, he called the round mound a rebound, but he just he wasn't a big dude. He just, like, was really athletic, super athletic, and, and like, knew how to bang bodies. Yeah, it's true. It's, it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a scary team. I'm not going to lie. It's just going to be a really scary team. It's always fun when you have a juggernaut team like that. It's 82 games of people gunning for them doing their best to be that <laughs> one of the few that like beat them that's how it was last year absolutely I mean, come on, 73 and 9 yeah well, no it's, it's good to see that they're going to be hated oh, I'm, I'm the, the, they're they're not going to be you know America's sweetheart now of course they'll have a lot of bandwagons it's, that's what you get the, the spoils of being very good but you know they're, they're kind of unlikable now which is what I what I I like I like that <laughs> I like not liking them all right uh, we mentioned the Celtics got Al Horford this is the first big free agent that they've been able to snag in what seems like forever. The Celtics seem to perennially have the cap space and the assets. And Danny Ainge, I mean, yeah. they, they were they originally yeah. had Daryl Morey in their employee, and they have so many first round picks at their disposal. It just seems the Celtics are always in trade talks. Yeah, and uh, they got they got a good thing going there. A young team. How do you feel about the Celtics next year? You think they can make some noise? Yes, big time. I like. Brad Stevens a lot. I think, you know, <clears throat> clearly my allegiance is to the Dallas Mavericks. And behind Pop, I think that Rick Carlisle is the second best coach in the league. You know, maybe he's not. Maybe he's definitely top five. But, I, I, you know, personally, I like him. But, man, Brad Stevens just is not far behind for me at all. I think he they, – they, they did well in, com- in committing to the approach that they wanted young players. You know, that, that's not, that Brad Stevens approach is not going to work with a lot of veterans – they're going to be disenfranchised. They're going to have their money, and they're not going to—they're not going to want to do what coach wants to do. But you have a bunch of guys who just came out of college where he was, and he knew how to handle. He knew the psyche. He knew exactly how to institute what he wanted to with those kids, and it's been great. A lot of talent, a lot of upside, and I think—I think this is the year. I think this is the year they break through. I think they'll be a top three team. In the really? East. Yeah. Whoa, top I think three. I think they'll be a top three team in the East. I think you know after the Cavs, after Toronto, I think you know. Who's, who's out it's there? It's kind of wide open, huh? Yeah, who's out there? I mean, everybody keeps thinking, like, the Wizards, like, but they just kind of perennially fall on their face. I think, you know, maybe the, the Heat are going to be good. I mean, what's Chicago? Is Chicago going to be good? The Knicks? I, I don't trust the Knicks. I don't <laughs> trust Chicago. I don't trust the Heat. I don't trust, I mean, maybe the Heat. But it's not, I don't expect it, but it would not surprise me one bit if they were the three seed. I think Chicago will be in that mix just because Jimmy Butler is really good, and then also uh, Dwayne Wade, and then they're they're big guy. I'm forgetting, I'm blanking on his name, but uh, I think they're going to be there. The Hawks were they've been a really good team the last few years. They kind of broke it up this summer. Mm-hmm. Now Al Horford lo- left. They traded away um, their starting point guard Teague. 
Mm -hmm. So I like Schroeder. He's a good player. Dwight's a weird move for them because it seemed like they lost two key players and maybe they were going in a rebuilding route. Yeah. But Dwight is. But to the, bring Dwight into Dwight that is was like, like the like... wrong move. Dwight is a he's a guy at this stage in his career where you can maybe plug him to like a, a, like one of those contending teams that needs like one more guy or something like that. I yeah. was I was really just like, man, why why doesn't he just go to Golden State? That's it's it's, exactly what you're talking but, about. Or he goes, why don't you go down to San Antonio? Why don't you just like just, come just join like, just join one of those super like you teams? Got, like, the thing is, I think he's. He's still ego. He still, you know, wants to be the man. That's why it, it was it was a lot of oil and water down in down in Houston. And I think he had a real opportunity if he could have checked his ego and realized like James Harden is is the engine to this thing. If I can if I can play off of him, ingratiate myself, and really kind of defer and take mine when I can get them, that team would have been a very good. That, that that's a, that's a shame that it didn't work out down in Houston yeah. um, because of ego. I think. Um, but yeah, I don't know what I don't know what Atlanta's doing. I think you were right where you said they were. They looked like they were building. It's just a confusing mix. A guy who wanted to come home got some money. I just it, it. I guess it seems like an okay fit, but just kind of confusing. Yeah, it is confusing. Just just a mix. Uh, and like they got some veteran guys there, Millsap, mm -hmm. Corver. So they have pieces to be good enough to make the playoffs, but not really contend. So no, I, no man's land. That's just. That's that's a tough place to be. It's where I've seen my my franchise for the last, I mean, since 2012. We've just been like that six to nine seed, and like really trying to figure out like we can't get any better, taking big shots, and not bad enough to, to, to turn it tear it down, but not good enough to really do anything. It's just a, it's a it's an awful place to be. Well, let's just you know what? Let's just move to them. Let's talk about the Mavericks, uh, and then we'll we'll do our. Uh, our annual Western Conference <laughs> predictions. Annual, but yeah, but <laughs> second second annual. Second. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk about Dallas. They added Harrison Barnes, essentially replacing Chandler Parsons as your uh, your three. You got Wesley Matthews in place, who is a plus for his position. Very good, uh, great defense, mm -hmm. and he just seems. I, I, maybe it's just like as a Rockets fan, he always seems to like make shots against us. He's really clutch. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be like he's not really that good, but against us, he's like Steph Curry or something uh, like that. Yeah, I think coming off an injury, he had a, he had a very interesting year. Uh, I I spent a lot of time thinking he was having a really good year, and you go and look at, at his deep stats, and it's it it wasn't. He wasn't all that great, but I gave him. A lot of leeway. Mainly, he ingratiated himself when he said, "No, I'm I'm committed to you guys. I'm coming." Like that, especially based on what happened last year with DeAndre, that really like went a long ways. <clears throat> um, but he was also coming off of knee surgery, and it took him and both Chandler Parsons coming off of big, big surgeries in the off season uh, a while to come back. So that was it was, it was a touch and go, um, and he really found his stroke. And he it, it's a confidence thing, man. When he's trusting that thing, you know he can shoot lights out and he I'm, i watched him come here to dc and hit 10 threes you know it's yeah. just that's that's the kind of shooter he can be um if if he's in the role i don't think they should try to expect too much out of him i think if they can have him a dn3 just sitting in the corner popping up you know if they want him to be a creator i don't think it's him but uh which which they might be asking him to do i mean they're asking a lot of him uh but i think he's a really really good player uh i, I don't think it should be overlooked that you know they re-signed Dirk. You know it wasn't going to go anywhere, but I think there were rumblings that you know Golden State uh, were were really kind of on the on the periphery, saying, "Hey, we're going to make a real run at this guy." Which I mean, if you're him, why not? Like, why not? Like, oh man, I would have been. I mean, you know, I, I I wouldn't as as a long term fan, I would not have begrudged him at all. I wouldn't have booed him. I wouldn't have done anything. I would have said, "Hey, I, I think it, it also it might have been the right move. It might have been you know, as I see it, and and and." Almost explicitly, Cuban has said, as long as Dirk is here, I'm not going to tear it down. I'm going to do everything I can to put the most competitive uh, team on the court. And with Dirk staying, taking less money, like they have committed to doing that. But what that means is really trading away their young assets or trading away their, their draft picks to try and rebuild, to try and bring in these middling kind of like, I mean, they took a flyer on Harrison Barnes. I mean, is that is he better than Chandler Parsons? Um, maybe he's better than what Chandler Parsons was in Dallas, you know, which was an injured guy that played seventy percent of his games, played one of eleven playoff games for us that we could have played. So he, he's he's better than that. Um, straight up, 
I don't know. I, I like him. I think he's more athletic. I think he's got uh, a lot of upside. Is he worth that money? It, I don't know, because like it's so brand new. This all this money that's coming through. Like, is Mike Conley worth 153? Yeah. You know, and the thing is, the salary cap is going to continually increase. So, so that's why you know maybe maybe it is a good deal considering where things are going. You know, mm-hmm. you're going to take it in the shorts this first year, but when these these contracts continue to escalate, like it's it's not going to be a bad deal in in three years, and he's still a young guy. So, um, and he was playing with a lot of talent. And in many ways, like when you play with a lot of talent, it makes the game easier. But Absolutely. You don't necessarily stand out yourself. So Barnes, he he got a lot of wide open threes, but just as a product of that system because mm-hmm. people were running Clay Thompson off the line, having to double team Steph Curry at times. Correct. So he was the he was the guy that got the open shots. That's not really his game. He was never really a catch and shooter. He you know, he's he really works well when he's able to cut, really yeah. use that athleticism. This yeah. is a guy coming out of college. People were projecting him as a number one, number two pick overall. Like he had the star talent, yeah. you know, like that stuff. So it'll be really interesting to see him now with more responsibility. You might see him be a little bit more of a creator. It's kind of just see the, the different basketball skills that we maybe haven't seen him utilize because he was. Yeah. With Golden State, didn't really have to do that. He was a guy that was like, "Well, I'm wide open. I don't have to create anything." Especially with the flow offense, I think with 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 Rick Carlisle's offense, he's he's really good on the offensive end, for finding finding matchups, exploiting things. So he's gonna get his touches. He's gonna get you know uh, some some good looks, some different. He's gonna be he's gonna be a different player. So is that better? I mean, is he good? That's what we're gonna find out because it's you know I mean, like you said, he he was asked to do something very different than than what he kind of. Uh, what he's going to be asked to do in Dallas, and I think that that's okay. I think that, that that's a it's a flyer they had to take, in my opinion. Um, there wasn't absolutely, I think, especially with the what's it, ninety percent mandatory cap use yeah. or whatever. So yeah. people, it's like you're throwing money around. It's like at this point, they're just like it's almost like you just having that marked up in the ledger. Yeah. Everything can be moved around. You're right. It's it's just a, it's accumulating assets and um, seeing what you get. Bogut, I've never. I've never been per- personally impressed by, but I think he'll be a good a good rim protector. Uh, former number one pick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he that was when the the Utah had both number one picks in the NFL and uh, basketball. That's right. Yeah. They had Alex Smith go and Andrew Bogut. Um, Who's had the better career? Andrew Bogut. <laughs> 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 um, he's got the ring. Um, that's true. But uh, yeah, I think I think that's a that's a, that's okay. I mean, I didn't mind Zaza. Um, but he's he's definitely better on the defensive end. That's for sure. Uh, Andrew Bogut is that that is. Um, it's easy. Well, <laughs> yeah. There's uh what what are the other? There were no other other moves. They re-signed Darren Williams, uh, who's had a little bit of a resurgence, and I think he's yeah, he's found a comfort. Had a, quietly had a solid season he's, last he's year. Found a little, he's found a little comfort being back home. Uh, and then uh, I think we just re-signed um, not Ryan Hollins. Who was it? Uh, Dwight Powell. Um, okay. Really young. That's right, big man, right? Yeah, upcoming guy. Just he, he'll fill out a little bit. Um, and then I really like the Virginia product uh, from last year, Rookie of the Year, Simba, um, Justin Anderson. Really good player, really versatile. Um, I think they're gonna they're gonna lean on him pretty heavy this year. He's gonna get a lot more looks with, with Parsons being gone. He's gonna be. Um, I don't. He, I don't think he'll start, but uh, he definitely uh, worked his way off the bench and got some 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 minutes as the season progressed, which is really tough to do. For Rick Carlisle team, um, you know he really leans heavy on his uh, on his um, veterans. Yeah, I, I, I doubt you guys gave Barnes ninety five million to come <laughs> off the bench, but you know what? I I am not uh, in charge of the front office, so let's talk about Houston, man. Let's talk about what you guys did. Houston, I kind of like the fact that we're sort of flying under the radar. I think most people probably rightfully so, or wondering whether or not we're even a playoff team as constructed. You know, I I really do think we, we definitely underachieved last year. It was just sort of a, a perfect storm of like a bunch of bad things, plus uh, unrealistic expectations from the previous season. There, there was a lot of things that went right for us to have the success that brought us to the Western Conference Finals. And there was also a lot of things that went wrong for us to like barely make the playoffs last year. The first one, uh, Ty Lawson was just a colossal failure. It just did not work on any level. When I, we got him over the summer, I was like, yes, because that was the one thing. You know, when we went to the Western Conference Finals two years ago, we didn't even have a point guard. We were playing Pablo Prigioni, who's back on the Rockets, so I guess I, <laughs> I'm a fan. Uh, but, you know, we Patrick Beverly was out. Um, and Patrick Beverly, he's 
you know, he's a pest. He's a fan favorite. He shouldn't be a starter on a good team. Just the way he plays, he tires himself out. That's the kind of guy you bring off the bench and you have him hound someone for a good 20, 25 minutes. That's not a guy that plays starter minutes. He'll tire himself out, then he's less effective. Right. And because he becomes less effective, it's not like he played much point guard anyways, but then it really puts a lot of pressure on Harden to do everything on offense, to yeah. create, get his own shot, create for others. Which, let's be honest, he kind of likes doing that. He likes doing, doing everything. Not for, he doesn't like creating wide open looks for Trevor Reason and having a reason brick it. <laughs> so that's the thing. We... We took the most three-point attempts in the league last year. It would make sense for us to have good three-point shooters, and we didn't last year. We, yeah. we didn't have good three-point shooters. So we went out and we addressed that problem. We got Ryan Anderson, who's mm-hmm. a really good three-point shooter for the four, and Eric Gordon, who's a really good three-point shooter at the, uh, two guard? At the two guard. So we brought in two guys that are good shooters. They're not necessarily the biggest names. Mm-hmm. You know, we were flirting with Al Forford at the very beginning of the free agency. He had a meeting with us. A lot of people thought that it went really well. It sounded like maybe there was a possibility there. He ultimately chose to go with the Celtics. Mm-hmm. It's a weird thing. I don't I don't know if it would have changed anything for most NBA fans, but I know for Rockets fans, I think if we would have signed Al Horford, everyone would have been like, oh, man, we might make some noise in the playoffs. But I actually I, I don't know if Ryan Anderson is that much of a downgrade. I think defensively. Really? Both bigs aren't really good. I think Al Horford's a better rebounder, but it, you weren't really going to make up that loss of Dwight. Gotcha. And I think Anderson fits our, our MO more. Mm-hmm. He can step out and shoot the three. Al Horford, I mean, he he can do that, but not really well. Yeah. And you don't really want him out there anyways. He's really good. Yeah, uh, you want him down low. Like you, want him, like you just said, he's a, he's a better rebounder. You want him down there getting rebounds. So I think the Rockets are a team that without – the expectations of being a playoff team can make some noise next year. I think they're going to play loose. We got Mike D'Antoni, it's uh, offense cooking, and that was the other thing. Uh, just you know, a few games in, firing Coach McHale, it just seemed like a, a team that was like making moves out of desperation mm-hmm. instead of like going all right, long term. What do we have to do? What's good? Harden showed up out of shape. Just a lot of bad things last year. Hopefully, the team will hit the ground running this year. Harden shows up in shape. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the new guys, they, they integrate into the offense. And, you know, it's going to be a lot of the same. With the Rockets, we're going to shoot a lot of threes. We got better guys now to do that. So, uh, Refresh me. B.J. Bickerstaff? Dave Bickerstaff, last year. J.B., sorry. Uh, he, he was there last year. Is he, who, who's your coach this year? Mike D'Antoni. Anybody coach for you guys? Did you bring him back? Is he a, is he a retread? No, no, no. No, you uh, guys are talking about Van Gundy. Van Gundy. Yeah, Van Gundy would have been the... Uh, okay, let's talk about that. Talk about Mike D'Antoni, the guy with three first names. Yeah. It was not very popular with Rockets fans. I really wanted to bring back Van Gundy. Really? I thought that would have been good. I think our, our weakness was defense, and our, our three-point shooting philosophy... I think the stuff that Kevin McHale had, and he's you know hardly an offensive guru, mm-hmm. he was able to create opportunities. Uh, Bickerstaff tried really hard to shore up our defense, but offensively we could score with the best of them even last year when we were a little discombobulated. So it just seemed like Mike D'Antoni coming in was fixing a problem that didn't really need fixing, but like completely not addressing the issue that we had, which was defense. So I guess we're just our philosophy this year is well. If you guys are going to score 130 on us, I guess we'll have to score 131. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, that – I've just never been a Mike D'Antoni fan. Um, and he's got fake teeth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he looks so different because he's shaved, so he doesn't have the Pringles. Oh, anymore. He looks so different. Oh, oh, I'm interested. Maybe need a little Google search here. <laughs> um, that might help his case out. Um, yeah, that was a Pringle. That's a great way of putting out Pringles and what mustache. Um, I mean, should we just do a quick rundown? Yeah, let's do a quick rundown. Power rank, it's number one. Phoenix Suns. I think so. <laughs> I mean, Eric Bledsoe, <laughs> this is his time. This is his time. Um, yeah, there's no... Tyson Chandler? There's... Uh, well, poor guy. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any any question who the number one team is. I think those guys are just going to... I mean, I think they'll win 75 games. I, I, tr- I truly think they'll go, go out and they'll win 75 games. Um, Golden State's going to be number one. San Antonio, how much, how much, how much are they going to fall off with with Tim Duncan? I mean, yeah, he wasn't like a big minutes guy, he wasn't a big points guy, but he was like a big guy in the room, and he was, you know, like he said, he, he Pop didn't have to worry about anybody because he knew Tim was out there taking care of it. I think they will miss him. Yeah, even last year, even when he wasn't 
the same Tim anymore. Not, you know, not a 20 and 10 guy. Mm-hmm. He, just his defense alone. He's really smart and he plays really good yeah. defense. And he anchors. He anchors that defense. And, you know, they really don't have any big guys. They had superstar Matt Bonner just retired. <laughs> George oh. Tim Duncan. They, oh. uh, I think um, Boban. The Dirk Stopper. Boban left. So, you know, and and Diaw left, so finally they, exposed Pop for the fraud that he's always been. Yeah, they got they got Paul Gasol to fill in that position, and he's he's you know, played Mar- some center. You know, Marcus is not going to be, you know, he'll. Yeah, between those two, they should be okay. I'm sure someone was. Oh no, that's right, David's favorite player, David Lee. Oh, you got David Lee. <laughs> I got David Lee. <laughs> um, you know, it, I mean, this was a pretty easy number two for me, honestly. With uh, with the big move with Kevin Durant going, I yeah. think I think they would have been. I think Oklahoma City would have been a, a very clear number two, um, and maybe you know, like a number one, given the way that that series went and the way they they pushed them to the brink and had them. On the edge. I mean, they did kind of what Oklahoma City does, which is choke, it seems like. I mean, they really find a way to not get it done <laughs> in the clutch. Um, Tell you what, though, if the Thunder find a way to be competitive, like, if they could find their, if they can eke their way into a top four spot, that's like a guaranteed Russell Westbrook MVP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's going to be scoring, like, what, 47 and 7? They'll, they'll, no, 40 10? I, I think, I think they will. I think they'll be a, a top four seed. I don't think they'll be three. Um, who else is out there? What, what other moves were made? It's not LA. It's not Sacramento. You gotta have the Grizzlies up there. Because Utah, not Port- how's Portland. They, they were decent. Uh, yeah, Grizz. Port- the Grizz, and the especially Grizz with with Parsons. Yeah, with Parsons. Yeah, it's a good team. So they'll they'll be a good. Uh, 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 I mean, do you think they could take number two? Oh, they're still behind. They're still distance between I, I, I them. Think so. and, and I think so. I would think so because they they've gotten older too. Mm-hmm. You know, Zebo's a little bit older. I love Parsons. He's always Mister Mister Humble. Okay. Like, yeah, I love going to a team that's that's never had a big superstar sign with them. Like, well, I mean, you're, I mean, just chill. Dude. <laughs> How's your knee feeling? Yeah, let's, Can you play? Uh, Self awareness is not his strength. Um, I, you know, no ill will. I, I think that that worked out the way it was supposed to for everybody. And I, I know, you know, I was, I still have it. You know, eighty percent done. I never gave it to you, but I wrote a little uh, piece about the the Chandler Parsons project about how it was. It's okay that he left, and not because I, I wish him ill will or I think he wasn't good, but I think for everybody's sake, moving on was the right move for him. Moving on was the right move for us. Um, so I wish him nothing but the best. He was a good dude. He seemed to really lack in Dallas, just timing-wise, whatever, didn't fit. But they'll be good. He's a good player. I hope he can be healthy because I think he's got he's got a little bit. I, I liked him ever since he was with Houston. When he came out of school, I thought, like, this guy's is, is, has got something. He's, is he a Gator, Florida Gator? Yeah. Yeah, man. Um uh, so then that's three, I think. And then f- I think Oklahoma City can be a four. It would not shock me at all. Do you think? I'm trying to think of teams that would, like, knock. There are some teams that I think will be really good, and I just don't know where to place them because they're young, and, uh, and part of it's just sort of trying to project improvement. I think the Utah Jazz are going to be really good next year. I think the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to be really good next year. Now we're talking. That's a great point. <laughs> Completely forgot about them. <laughs> yeah, you got just, Cat, you got Wiggins. <laughs> They've got, I mean, oh man, who's their coach? Do we know? A lot of it has to do with can they find somebody that can harness that and, and get it going the right direction. For some reason, like Minnesota as a franchise, they're they're not they're not cursed. They can just there's just some franchises that just they find a way to mess things up. <laughs> and like until you know until like the Splash Brothers, Golden State was one of those. You yeah. know they were they were kind of like the the epitome of like like finding a way to mess things up so who knows do you think the, the pelicans can make any noise we took their best players yeah. so no <laughs> no I, the pelicans uh, anthony davis is a top five player that this and there are there are you know give mike conley his due but like there are guys above that level that deserve to be paid much more than that i mean there's there's like give my man like clayton kershaw mike trout money give them 200 million dollars give them i mean and, and the point I've always kind of uh, understood is that the team that they play for in the NBA is secondary. They t- they play for Nike. They play for Adidas. They play for Under Armour. Because that's like, Kevin Durant got a $300 million deal. Yeah. You know, Steph Curry, I don't know what his deal is, but it's, it's sizable. LeBron's was undisclosed, but it's a half a billion dollars at least I mean you know like that's well Steph Curry's deal wasn't good enough for him to actually get decent looking shoes <sighs> those were yeah those were, those were pretty rough <laughs> and and then he took credit for it he, I mean he took he took fire for it which was good I mean, you know he, he deserved it and those were some boo-boo shoes so 
I don't I don't have a uh, a problem with that at all. Um, You're totally right though. Like a guy like Durant can take a quote unquote discount to go to the Golden State Warriors because he's, he's got money. It doesn't in the matter. Bank. He's got money in the bank. Yeah, the Supermax. It's sorry before we get too far into Supermax. The Clippers. The Clippers are there. Yeah. The Clippers. So are that there. that might be a that that might be the only thing keeping out uh, Memphis. And I mean keeping uh, OKC out from the, the the top four seed. I think it'll be. I think the Clippers and, and Memphis will, will duke it out for the number three four spot in some order. And then yeah. I think the clip the uh, the OKC. We'll wrap up number, f- number five, maybe. OKC should still be fun, though. I like Oladipo. Yeah. Victor Oladipo's a fun player. Him and him and Westbrook. That would be a, a nice, fast break tandem. Um, but sorry, going back into uh, Supermax talk, I think there are a handful of guys. I think, you know, Kevin Durant, one of them. Steph Curry, another. Uh, LeBron, obviously. I think, you know, who who, who else in, in, in this league? I mean, maybe, like... Anthony Davis, Anthony Davis, Carl Anthony Towns, maybe you know who 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 knows. I mean, there there's maybe ten players that should get it, but it just shouldn't. They should go straight like I major put, league I soccer. Where they, yeah, in. I mean, and, and and I guess it comes down to if somebody's willing to pay them that because more than more than wins, they they bring you like money. Yeah. <laughs> they bring you just. I mean, there's a reason that this cap is going up and going up again, and it's because of the labor agreement that they came up with. It's like, hey, you guys are making a lot of money. Like, let's share the wealth here, and like, they're they're finally doing it. So, good for them. I think it's it's, I think the supermax should exist. I think there are guys that are, you couldn't make up the the amount of money that that the that the NBA as a whole has made from LeBron James or the Cavaliers or the slash the Heat have made from that guy. I mean, it's just, you could pay that guy eighty million the rest of his career, and like. I don't think it would it would it would do justice to what he gave from the years like twenty one through thirty, where he just was an Iron Man, didn't miss games, played deep into the play. How many times? He's been to the finals seven straight years. Yeah. Like, he's incredible. He is. He is, and, and good for him. I mean, as much like bad will as he as he engendered for me during the twenty eleven season, you know, kind of making fun of Dirk doing all that stuff. Like, he just he wiped the slate absolutely clean with what he did this last year. I mean, it was just so impressive. Oh, and I was rooting for them so hard yeah, in the and, finals. And how do you, like, how do you make up, how, like, what's the number? What's the amount? What's the dollar amount that makes that make sense? I think it has to be something that is almost, like, off the books. Like, here's your cap. And you have a player, and you look at, you open the books to that one player, and you say, look, man, we made $300 million last year. We paid $100 million out. We're going to give you $100 million. Because that's what you were worth in jersey sales. That's what you were worth in tickets on the road. Everywhere that guy goes, he plays 82 games a year. That dude is selling out for the NBA. And, and it may not need to come from the, the teams itself. Maybe it comes from the NBA. Maybe it says, hey, you are valuable to us, the NBA. So we're going to give you from our profit sharing there. I, I don't know how it works. I don't know. I mean, these guys are smart. They're all creative. But it, it just seems to make sense. And this is another labor argument where, again, I, 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 I don't. I don't fault a guy for taking money going anywhere anymore. I think it's it's very charming and novel that like Kobe, Kobe, Dirk, and uh, Tim Duncan like are staying with their team for their entire careers. But that's just not that speaks to them. That speaks to like they were they were never endorsement guys. They were never they were all about basketball and like being comfortable and being at home and that's what they enjoyed. So they may I don't, be the last generation of superstars that are like that. Yeah, though. I mean who who else could I mean. Maybe Steph. Maybe Steph could stay. You know. Oh, Steph. Yeah, he I could. could. He's Steph got a chance. Might be one of those guys. You know. I thought I, I swore Dwayne Wade was gonna be a Heat lifer. I don't know why he didn't. It just made. I mean, I think. I think that was just they low ball Pat him. Riley really not. He 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 played it poorly. He played it and he thought he thought the same exact thing that we did. He said, "Look, you're not gonna leave. Legacy is here. You're Mr. Heat. You're like you know been to five titles. I mean, you, you've been to five championships. You won." You know, three of them. Like, where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna have this kind of love? Where are you gonna have like, there ain't no South. Beach. Like South Beach is like, it's yeah. it's real. <laughs> like, yeah. you know. So that was a real big shock. Him going him going up to Chicago. Um, good for him though. I think, you know, you want to feel valued. That's that's what it's all about. That's what these guys. They don't get there without ego. You don't become a world class athlete without being the best until you get there. You know. Mm-hmm. So. I, I mean, there was. Did he was he ever the highest paid player on his team? He might be another one of those guys that that kind of wasn't. Because I think maybe he and um, LeBron and Chris Bosh all had same money. 
Yeah, they took a he took a pay cut so they could all fit when they created the uh, the big three. Mm-hmm. But, but I think before that, the years before that, I think he was the highest played okay. player on the team. And, and totally, like uh, deserving. He was a complete stud. He is. He's great. He's still a great player. He's, he, he. The problem is he can't do it, and that's the the problem with age is that they've all got that one bullet, and they have to like they have to hold it. They, they've all got it in there. Yeah. You just you can't do it eighty two nights a year. Um, I don't know. You want to talk about the East? Sure. Let's just go run down the East. Number one, Cleveland. Yeah, I think it's like it's like easy. You got like the top teams. <laughs> yeah. You got number two. Who do you like at number two? We got Toronto. Yeah. Perennially a yeah, good they've team. They've got. Is it uh, Dwayne Casey that's out there? Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's a good team, man. That's a really good, solid. There's nothing wrong with them. I think they they. It's not stage fright. They just may not have the horses to compete with. With with the with the heat with with the Cavs, they can play a great season. But when it comes down to it, they don't have LeBron. <laughs> mm. You know, I mean, they've got a lot of good athletic pieces. Um, that's but th- I think I think it's fair to say that they're they're a number two they're a number two seed. Um, my surprise, I'm I'm all about surprises this year. I think Boston. I would really Boston like to number see, three. I would like to see Boston. Like re- it, I don't think it's gonna happen, but it would not surprise me at all if they did. Uh, as we've talked about before, you know, I'm a big Brad Stevens fan. Um, I think he's the perfect coach in the perfect situation. Danny Ainge is a really, really good GM. He's done it. He's done it a couple different ways, a couple different times, and like really, have managed to put his underlings in a position to be successful. He continually does that, and that's all you want from a general manager. You want to make sure that they're putting their guys in a position to succeed. And I think he he continually does that. Um, Brad Stevens is going to do what he can to max out these guys. They're all young. He just signed Al Horford. Um, so I think that's going to be a big, a big boon for them. I think, you know, I don't know how they are, um, if they needed the help offensively, um, but he's not, he's not going to hurt. That's for sure. Um, so look for them. What do you think? I'm not going to argue too hard there. I think other teams will probably be up there. The Pacers. What do you think of the Knicks? You know, I don't know. Maybe it's like, I feel like, eh, it's like Derrick Rose doesn't move the needle for me, but then like all of a sudden, <laughs> what, what if they're like actually like Because this is good. a totally... All these were totally Knicks moves that always don't work out. Yeah. I think that's why. That's why you just, it's almost like the boy who cried wolf, and it's like, oh, here, here it is. And it's like, everybody's like, no. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't be doing things to cultivate the young talent. Um, forgive me, I forgot his name. Um, oh, yeah. Porzingis? Porzingis. Like, how you haven't done everything to say, like, sorry, Carmelo, we're trading you. We're trading you to the Olympics for like for good. No, like just for, go play for, in the Olympics. Forever. Porzingis is legit good. He though. is man. That's a future superstar. He is but really good. Couldn't you just see the Knicks really like messing that up? It's like if anybody could mess that up, couldn't it be the Knicks? It would be the Knicks. Right. It would be the Knicks. Um. So they're bringing in a lot of guys that are going to really. Joakim Noah seems to be a really like a pros pro, so that might not be a bad move. I don't know. What I fear is like they're going to instill, like poor work ethic in him. Um, and I don't think, like, Carmelo Anthony's ever been known as a hard worker. I don't know anything about... I know D. Rose came back from a from a, a really debilitating knee injury and really worked his butt off, um, so may, that may not be an issue, but he clearly needed needed a change of scenery, so maybe maybe this happens. Maybe this works. I mean... Maybe it does. I I just... I'm with you. I love Porzingis. I think he's he has potential to be a really special player. I just I don't like the idea of adding yet another ball dominant player to keep the ball away from him. We already yeah. have Carmelo, yeah, and now you're bringing Derrick Rose. Who it's it's like no, the, your future is with Porzingis, and mm-hmm. he's probably the best player on your team right now, unless mm-hmm. you get Olympics Carmelo back <laughs> back back to the, the Knicks. So um, I guess I guess they're in the playoff mix. It's it's the East is tough for me. To me, it's like wide open. So it's more like just listing. The teams after Cleveland. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's kinda... that's absolutely. I think that's that's correct. I like Orlando. I liked them last year. That was my sleeper team last year too. I think yeah. you I like think Orlando? Orlando, but Orlando and Milwaukee. Those are like my my teams that I, I really like. I just uh, Aaron Gordon and his ridiculous dunks in the uh, slam dunk contest. No, I think I, I, I cheer for Milwaukee. I can see Milwaukee doing. I, I, I would Greek like to freak? see them doing something. Yeah, that's a good team and a good market and a good basketball. Um, they have a great court too. I love the basketball court. Yeah, got the buck in there. Yeah, their, re- the their rebranding was really well done. Phenomenal. Their colors that they do it. They went simple. Is it the green and the green and black and white? Yeah. Um, really nice. What are the Bulls? Do they do anything for you? The Bulls, I like I said, I, I think they're gonna be up there. Miritich, I think that's his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's like the big guy there. Yeah, they have Jimmy Butler. 
and they have uh, Dwayne me, Wade now. I'm, Mitrich. Yeah, Doug McDermott, Doug McDermott. <laughs> yeah, Nikola Mirotic. Bobby Portis, Ray John Rondo. And, and okay, like I'm gonna be guilty. I did not know Ray John Rondo was in <laughs> was in was in Chicago. And Bobby Portis is a he's a good he's a good young player. So they got a lot of they got a lot of pieces there. I like the Bulls. I like the Bulls. I I, I could see them contending for a top. Yeah, I think spot. I think like. Three through seven, there it's a, it's a smorgasbord, and it could be you just you, you put them in a hat, you throw them out in whatever order they land in. Like that could be yeah. just the way it goes. Brooklyn, yeah, Jeremy yeah. Lin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, they're like the well. one team. They're like, yeah, that's probably that's probably not gonna be very Negative. good. Negative. Them and them and, and Charlotte, maybe. Um, yeah, who's? I mean, Charlotte's got a uh, Kemba. Yeah, it's just not a. It, the East does nothing for me ever. It, I mean, like with the exception of like where LeBron is, the East has done nothing. For me personally, for the last like 15 years. Yeah, how is Miami gonna be this year? They'll be all right. They got they resigned Hassan Whiteside. They've got uh, that's it though. Who's their Goran who's their Dragic? point guard? Dragic. Mm. And then what else? Uh, is, mean, is 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 Chris is Chris Bosh retiring? Is he back? Is he? Yeah, no, he has like a uh, his medical issue. I don't know if he's gonna play basketball. So anymore. I mean, there's not much they can do. It sounds like Dwayne left, and uh, what was it their small four? Well, Dang left. Well, Dang. Well, Dang went. So the Lakers, the Lakers might be a, an interesting team next year. I mean, who are you joking? <laughs> <laughs> that team is boo boo. I cheer for their failure. <laughs> the longer they're just bad, the better off that will be. Um, I think they lost a lot when Doctor Bus died. Now they're just like they're like a rudderless ship at this point. I think yeah. they 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 suffer from a lot of the things that my favorite football team does, um, the Dallas Cowboys. Which is remember when we used to be good, like really good, yeah. like. Come on, <laughs> and that—that's it. That's the extent of like, like, we can be good again because we used to be good. It's like, oh yeah, it's really like, yeah, LA, people like, want to play for LA because it's LA. Yeah, but that's not the case anymore. People used to want to play for LA because you had like access to media, you had access to commercials, you had access. But like, it is NBA. Like, hop on Twitter and you got you got all the attention you need. I mean, you know, it's just True. you don't need LA anymore. And I don't know, I don't know that the NBA cares as much as they used to when they like really would jerry rig the the draft with like the frozen envelope and patrick ewing to new york and you know like they don't need la like i mean look look who's look who the darlings are like Mm -hmm. golden state like perennially nobodies and now steph curry sells more jerseys than like i don't know like probably half the teams in the nba fair enough i i just i think most people would think the lakers just from last year they're probably gonna suck i I think they have a couple interesting pieces. I like Brandon Ingram. Yeah. I think he's going to be a good player. D'Angelo? D'Angelo, you know, love him or hate him. I think he's like, uh, he, he doesn't come off as the best. He's not a good teammate, it, that's for sure. Yeah, he's not a good teammate. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nick Swaggy P will be the first. Uh, to, uh, poor Swaggy P. Poor Swaggy P. Uh, no more. He's not, uh, he's not with uh, Iggy anymore. I cheer for that guy's failure. <laughs> but they have. Uh, he's, then, he's definitely like the, the, the like, right after J.R. Smith. He's like the irrational confidence guy, like oh, in the yeah. award. So oh, like, it, sure. it, like now that it's been passed on from like Jet Terry, yeah. like just like the irrational confidence guy is just like somebody who like, for no other reason than like his own belief in himself is gonna yeah. like hoist shots. I think there's nobody that you know like uh, an ultimate like confidence guy like that was uh, Gilbert Arenas. I felt like. Gilbert oh, is Gilbert really was good. So awesome, though. but like when he would shoot shots and turn around and start <laughs> celebrating, that was so awesome. <laughs> All right, well, fair enough. Uh, man, I, fair I enough. love that guy. We had a, a pet snapping turtle back when we were in college. I named him Gilby for Gilbert Arenas. Yeah, for Gilbert Arenas. Did he come with a gun? <laughs> 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 um, let's, speaking of the gun, let's talk about the Whiz Kids. Our, uh, our, our, you know, we we do this show out of Washington D.C., so it, it would be it would be. Unfair if we didn't give a little a little love to the uh, to the local team. Um, I think they made a totally Washington Wizards move in bringing in what I think is one of the like four worst coaches in the NBA. I think <laughs> he is horrible. I think he is a bad coach who doesn't have he doesn't have the look of somebody who's going to make command respect in a room, which is why Oklahoma City just deuced all over him. I mean, Scotty Brooks. Sorry if you guys don't know who we're talking about. Scott Brooks was just. He was Eric Spolstra if Eric Spolstra didn't have, like, a guy like LeBron and Dwayne Wade who really cared about their legacy. Like, if they just were cared about hoisting shots and, like, looking good and being cool. Like, you know, 
it, it, they, they, they could have been interchangeable for me because I don't think Eric Spolster is all that great either, honestly. Uh, I think he's a little bit luckier um, with the talent that he, he, he acquired or that was acquired for him. Um, but Scott Brooks is just, I think he's a, I think he's a fraud. I just, I, I think like Randy, Randy, Whit, what was his, Whit, Whitman? Randy yeah, Whitman. Whitman. Yeah. He, he was not a good coach. Um, and he, he was just, <laughs> well, he was just a guy who was out of touch. He just he just didn't understand the game had 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 moved beyond um, what he was trying to do and I think he was trying to do what the what the uh, what the what the Rockets were doing which is shoot a lot of threes without three point shooters I think he didn't realize like yeah we know we know all about that <laughs> oh you know what the the we got a little DC Houston connection real quick yeah. uh, Nene we picked up Nene over okay. the off season and rumors are he might he might actually start has looked really good in the Olympics he's he's slimmed down. Quite a bit. Usually has a little bit of a chunkier oh, yeah. look, and he, he looks really uh, in shape. Good for uh, him. Look, look in the Olympics. So, you know, we got him. Uh, I think on a bet minimum. So, I mean, a hell of a deal considering the money that's been thrown around. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think the the problem too is is John Wall, who is undeniably phenomenal talent. Just, so fun to watch. He is. Yeah. He's electric, man. But I think he just doesn't know how to put it together. For 48 minutes or for 82 games and he just he mentally checks out i don't know that he's a mental midget but i think he just Ooh. cannot hot he, takes he's, well, he's just hot not somebody takes. he's not somebody that i would that I would, that I would put trust in and i you know as much as, as i can I, I i like rooting for dc i like i like them to do well i would like you know save for the redskins <laughs> but uh, but uh, washington for the for the whiz you know they're, they're, it's a good it's a good time when i go out there and watch them play i just think He's not the guy that I would I would put in charge of because he, he can he can go off and he can he can light up fifteen in a row and he'll you know he'll he'll, he'll put he gets buckets I mean he gets buckets um, and he's great on the defensive end too he's he's a really good talented player I just don't know about the mental makeup um, Bradley Bill's kind of always hurt perennially I think I feel bad for the guy I think people tell me he's a really great player um, and when I see him I'm like okay he looks like a serviceable two guard um, but he's he can shoot obviously but he just no falls with him. He can't stay healthy. You know, he's had the wrist injury. He had a what else? Did new, he do? Mac, new max contract. Oh, good for that, him. They'll help heal some wounds. Yeah, it'll help make a count. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, it's kind of awkward because uh, John Wall was quite vocal about Reggie Jackson's max deal last year. Yeah, he must love the new deal <laughs> his buddy Bradley Beal got. You, you gotta, you gotta love when like <laughs> you're the best player on the team and the guy <laughs> next to you is making so much more than you. Um, it's a it's an interesting team. I, those are interesting comments about John Wall. John Wall, when he came into the league, he was just this really uh, very brash individual. He had this little John Wall dance, and he had this swagger <laughs> about him. And you just wouldn't recognize that when you see him now. He's grown up. Yeah, he's he's matured, but also he. See, I, I don't have your. You don't think he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna fall off in the middle of a game or just like I think he can be. Maybe what I should have said is he can be taken out of his game. Yeah, but I don't know if it's because he's mentally broken or because he's checked out. Like, I don't think it's a mental thing for him. I think he's, like, on the entire game. I think he looks like he's just one of those guys that's a, a fierce competitor. Okay. Um, maybe not, like, on, like, a Russell Westbrook level, but, like, Yeah, okay, that, this is, that's, okay. But somewhere close. I think his problem is he's limited by what he can do on the court, and I think in the NBA, especially today, for a point guard and what he does, you know, Late '90s, early 2000s, that was his wheelhouse. The, the 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 dominant point guard that would just like drive it towards the bucket. Now the point guard, you need to be able to shoot. You need to the three. Open up, you know, it. Yeah, yeah, to open up the space for your teammates. He's not a really good shooter, and you've seen opponents start be able to game him. So when they start standing back, baiting him to shoot, it forces him to do something he's not really good at, and takes away the thing he's really good at. Because now they can catch up with him because they're giving him the space when he tries to drive on them. So it takes away one of his strengths. And then forces them to, you know, shoot, which is, I mean, if he makes it, they're like, we'll, we'll take that. It's kind of like when opponents would play us. I remember when we had Josh Smith, and, you know, he'd get, like, so many wide-open threes. And it was mm-hmm. like, all right, I guess we'll live or die if he, Josh Smith makes <laughs> threes. And as Rockets fans, we're just like, no, 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 yes. yes. Or no, 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 no. You know no. what the best thing that could happen to uh, to John Wall is if they could trade him for, like, 2004 Steve Nash. Like if they could just switch places. Like I think like Steve Nash in today's NBA and John Wall in that NBA like would have just been in their element and much, much better had much better career. Like I mean, 
Steve Nash is a Hall of Fame for two MVPs. Yeah. What the hell am I talking about? Honestly, yeah. like that dude, he he was okay. He, he transcended. Okay. He, he made it work. Man, bitter Mavericks fan <laughs> over here. <laughs> uh, you guys awesome, could have offered him the money. Uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, we don't have to get into that, but I think he never becomes that player if he stays in Dallas. You think I so? Think, I think it was perfect. I think it worked out the, the way it should have for everybody. I think him being in in uh, in Phoenix was was really good for him. It it, it really like gave him like a competitive like it gave him like a fire in his belly and like he he was awesome i mean he was steph curry before steph curry he just didn't take as many shots i mean the 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 averages he's taking you know now he was also doing it like not from like 28 feet or 30 30 yeah. 32 feet i mean like that's the the real game changer changing yeah. changing the geometry of the game and will uh those nash finley dirt mavericks though they were fun a, to watch that was that was a good team all right hey Brian, it's been uh, it's been so fun doing this. We're uh, <laughs> so it's a bit of a longer episode. This one, this is <laughs> hey, the, the, gonna be the, a lot on the, on the editing room the, floor. The, hopefully, the, yeah, the the Brian special when you come, it's uh, it's always fun. You know, this is why we like to do this podcast: talk sports with you and uh, get your hot takes. Calling out John Wall, <laughs> yeah, poor John uh, Wall, and uh, you know, demanding greatness from Conor McGregor and. Golden State Warriors. So, uh, thanks for having me on, Viet. It's really fun, uh, and you know, it only took a year to come back, so hopefully, uh, it won't be so long next time. <laughs> Guys, again, I'm gonna be putting in the description below his Twitter handle. You guys need to check him out. Super funny. Has the best insights. On <laughs> yeah, if you sports. want to see some good fight analysis, that's uh, yeah. Follow this guy. I'm gonna be putting this stuff down in the description below. Guys. For the latest updates on our blog and podcast, subscribe. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up again. I want to thank our guest, Brian, for coming on. It was so fun. I'm your host, Viet. And until next time, we are the Bros Bros. You, you knows. knows. Son of a bitch! Teruto Ishihara says he doesn't like MMA, but does it anyway to impress women. If his face couldn't do the job before, it definitely won't be able to do it after his time in the UFC. Also, he has a nose ring. If Dan Henderson is Fred Flintstone, then Michael Bisping is either Bam Bam, Dino, or Pebbles. This makes Dana White Mr. Slate. Naturally, the best fit is Mrs. Henderson as Wilma. Dominic Cruz says he taught the bantamweight division to, quote, grow a pair. Unfortunately, he didn't specify what he meant, and Hen and Barrow had to move up a weight class because of his new breasts. Barrow was last seen crying and eating ice cream while watching a Lifetime movie after his featherweight debut loss to Jeremy Stevens. Alistair Overeem is impressed by CM Punk's approach to fighting and thinks that with a little horse meat, Punk can also have a successful UFC career. Three fans were shot at an MMA event in Rostov, Russia, because apparently this is the one place where wrestling doesn't translate to MMA. John Jones didn't actually test positive for estrogen blockers. It was just a byproduct of all the recreational drugs combined with his complete lack of empathy. Hooray? Conor McGregor says UFC 200 bombed without him, though not as badly as he bombed trying to throw water bottles. Sorry guys, that's all I've got.